The 25th Hour Radio Show. I'm speaking with explorer Steve Elkins, the focus of the National Geographic Channel's Explorer, Legend of the Monkey God, which premieres Sunday, October 4th at 7 p.m. Central Time. Steve, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. You know, Steve, I'm reading over your article in this month's edition of National Geographic Magazine, and it states, you know, in the mid-1990s, uh, a documentary filmmaker named Steve Elkins became captivated by the legend of a white city and embarked on an effort to find it. First of all, what is the legend of the white city, you know, the legend of the monkey god, and what was it about that legend that made you want to find it? Well, the legend has a variety of... Uh, there's a variety of vari- variations of the legend, but it essentially says that out in this vast jungle, the Mesquitia jungle, which is about the eastern half of Honduras, uh, there apparently existed some large city or culture or civilization, whatever you want to call it. It was very sophisticated, and the walls of the building were built out of white stone. That's what many people have reported and many of the legends talk about, as well as some legends talk that talk about the fact that they worshipped uh, a monkey god, and there would be a statue of a monkey god. So whether these things are true or not, nobody really knows. We still really don't know. It's certainly worthwhile looking for. Yeah, now, now there have been other explorers who have searched for the city long before you, right? What, what gave you the confidence that you'd oh, be the yes. one that wanted to succeed? Well, I didn't know if I would succeed. I wanted to try. Mm-hmm. There's been many explorers that have been looking for this for a long time, many even very well-financed explorers. The uh, Smithsonian uh, Institution, when it used to be called the Museum of the American Indian in the 30s, they sent several expeditions. And then there are other people before me, and even people that concurrently while I was looking, they were looking. Mm-hmm. I think what happened in my case is I fortunately read about airborne LIDAR. And this was a revolution in the world of discovery. Because for the first time in history, There was a technology that allowed you to fly over a jungle area, collect data, process it, and digitally wipe away the vegetation and see what's lying on the ground. I mean, this this was a revolution to be able to do this. Instead of wandering aimlessly on foot, hoping you're going to stumble upon something, you could look over a vast area and quickly peruse it on a computer and go, oh, yeah, there's looks like these are some buildings. Now, now what what is light on? Structures we should look at. LIDAR is a technology that uses pulsed laser beams, Mm -hmm. millions of them per second, kind of like radar or sonar. It sends out a lot of beams. And many of them, when they they hit the the jungle, they hit the treetops, they hit the leaves, and they bounce back, and you get great pictures of leaves and treetops. But enough of them make it between the leaves and between the trees and everything else and hit the ground and then bounce back. And if you get enough enough dots, enough, enough laser beams back, you can create an image of what the surface uh, underneath the forest looks like. So what we see is not really like a photo image of the object, but you see elevation changes in the ground. And if you see these elevation changes that are geometric or in the shape of a building, you immediately recognize this is something man-made. You know, a project like this has to involve quite a few people, uh, or does it? I mean, what kind of team did you have working with you? Well, actually, I'm standing on the shoulders of many people because it does take a lot of people and it takes a fair amount of money to make all this happen. So there's a, a, there are other explorers that in fact told me the legend to begin with. In fact, one of them, two of them actually were from St. Louis. One of them unfortunately has passed away and the other one um, has had some strokes, so he's no longer able to, mm-hmm. to speak, but I really owe them to get me started in this. They or they helped organize the first expedition back in 94. They were the ones who told me about the legend. And when we went, um, we were walking around and we came across this boulder and this beautiful mountain stream far, far away from any inhabited area. And on this boulder was carved a very interesting sculpture or carving of what looked like a man with a fancy headdress and a stick and maybe a gourd or some bag with seeds coming out of it. And I immediately said, what is this picture doing here in the middle of nowhere? This environment must have been very different in the past. Now, on a side note, I also read in the magazine article that you were in such a dense and remote part of the jungle that the animals seemed to be unafraid of the human presence. 
Uh, that has to be a very interesting, uh, a very interesting experience in itself, right? Yes. Um, and then we're talking about the expedition we just did in February when we finally went to the site. Um, it apparently, according to all the scientists, and we even hired uh, three people from the British SAS, that's their special forces, and all they do is go from one jungle to another jungle all over the world. And they were shocked at how unafraid the animals were. The hummingbirds would come up to us when we first got there, and they would buzz around people's faces without any fear. Other animals would come by. The monkeys all came by. And according to these people who spend all their time in the jungles all over, they said they'd never seen anything like this. I mean, I've been in jungles, and I've seen a lot of wild animals. Um, and it's true. They were, there was no fear. Now, as long as it's not snakes, right? As long as it's, it's, it's the snakes that stay away, correct? <laughs> well, unfortunately, that didn't happen. I don't think the snakes cared one way or the other. In fact, there's a snake called the Fear Lance, which is probably one of the deadliest snakes in the Americas. And I think its reputation is bite first and ask questions later. Yeah. And unfortunately, its venom is very, very bad. Um, we uh, had four encounters with Fear Lance. A couple of them were a little close. Yeah, too close for comfort. I mean, nobody got bit. Yeah. Well, you know, without giving away too much about what you found, <laughs> what did you find? I mean, was the White City everything you had hoped it would be? It was everything that we saw in the LIDAR and more. So, yes, in the back of my mind, of course, I hoped that I would, you know, we would see a monkey god statue. I mean, I knew that the odds were really against that because it's a legend. Mm -hmm. But, you know, still you have that hope. Um but I was I was very I felt very vindicated because exactly what we saw on the lidar we were able to see exactly that on the ground very quickly, and then find more things and much to our everyone's surprise, we stumbled actually by accident, on a cache of 52 gorgeous carved stone objects, bowls, effigies, and so on, and that was really spectacular. The archaeologists couldn't contain themselves; they were so excited. Now this is just the tip of the iceberg, correct? Since you have discovered uh, this much evidence. More extensive expeditions have been planned, right? Yes. Uh, we're hoping to send a group there in the beginning of the year, some other arche archaeologists, some members of the same team, and perhaps some other people, to go and excavate those 52 objects that are still sitting there. And that would hopefully be the beginning of a long period of research and excavation going on. Because this whole area, the, the Mesquitia jungle, is a jewel for the world. It's one of the most biodiverse areas left in the world, and certainly in, in Central America. So it's, it's almost a living laboratory for many different scientists of different disciplines, as well as the cultural patrimony is virtually almost unknown. Very little is known about it, and now here's an opportunity for people to be able to study it. And I think the work will go on long after you and I are dust. Yeah, you know, if I understand correctly, the site actually could be in danger of jungle clear-cutting? Are, are you in a, a race for time here? We certainly are in a race for time. I mean, we, I knew this ahead of time by looking at satellite images, doing flyovers, and looking at, you know, you can look at Google Earth and see what's going on. Uh, when I first started going there, the jungle was much larger than it is now, and every year it gets smaller and smaller as clear-cutting goes on. At first, I thought it was just for timber. They have mahogany, which is worth a lot. But I've learned from our last trip that actually... They don't care so much for the timber. They go in there and just clear cut the land for cattle in there. And I don't know, you know, I, I, the politics of why it's happening, I can't really comment on. But it is happening, and it's endangering the forest. And I think probably in 10, 15, 20 years, if nothing's done, the whole area will be gone. You know, I want to, again, mention you can watch the premiere of Explorer Legend of the Monkey God Sunday, October 4th at 7 p.m. Central on the National Geographic Channel. Steve, is there any other locations uh, as far as website or social media that might bring awareness to the project you're involved with? Well, I think right now the best place is probably, just like you say, watch the show and then read the October issue of National Geographic magazine, mm -hmm. as well as um, there was an article in New Yorker magazine in 2013. We don't have a, a specific website up, but I think if you just type in Lost City, Honduras, Ciudad Blanca, Honduras, and Google, you'll read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of articles. Some most true, some of them not true, as most things on the Internet. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, is there anything else you'd like to mention that I, that I might not have uh, touched on before we start to wrap things up here? 
Well, I guess I would say that um, I, I have to give the government of Honduras a lot of credit for stepping up to the plate and giving us a tremendous amount of assistance in, the, assistance in this project, which would have been very difficult without them. And the current president, Hernandez, has also taken it, it's making it his personal mission to stop the destruction of the rainforest and to try and protect it and also to protect the cultural patrimony. I hope that he is successful at it because this is really one of the world's treasures and it's just not a benefit for Honduras but for all of us. Well, Steve, once again, thank you for joining me on the show. I wish you the best of luck moving forward with this project. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Radio Show. Show.